This has not been a good day yesterday. Just 18 hours ago, there was a shooting in Tennessee. That shooting at a Tennessee school occurred at a convenience school in, part, in, in the Green Hills of Nashville, Tennessee. Six people and three children were, and three staff members were killed. So again, there were six people, three children, and three staff members were all killed at that school. There is now a very latest happening. In just a few minutes, we're going to tell you the very latest. Like who the victim, like who the suspect is and all. But first, let's look at... Let's look at who the victims are and who the suspect is. Always find a way back. Another sick massacre at a small school. Police raced to the scene where six were killed, including three nine-year-old children. George, it makes you sick to your stomach to see other students hurrying to safety, the terror visible on one child's face through a school bus window, the president ordering flags be flown at half-staff as we are learning more about the victims and a possible motive. In just a few moments, we will hear from Nashville's chief of police, John Drake, with more on the investigation where it stands right now. But first, Eva Pilgrim is there for us live on the scene in front of the school. Good morning, Eva. Robin, this is a small church school, about 200 students, pre-K through sixth grade. The doors of the school were locked, but that shooter firing their way in. And this morning, we have to warn you, the images you're about to see are disturbing. Overnight, the Metro Nashville Police Department releasing this surveillance video showing the moments the driver of this car shot their way into a private Christian school. Once inside, killing three young children and three staff members in what police are calling a targeted attack. All units, be advised, we're under a mass casualty alert. The first 911 calls coming in at 10.13 a.m. Be advised, stay out of the general area of Burton Hills Road. Authorities identifying the shooter as a 28-year-old female, Audrey Hale, saying the shooter identified as transgender. The surveillance video showing the shooter driving up to Covenant Presbyterian School just before 10 a.m., shooting out the glass inside these doors. She entered the school through a side entrance and traversed her way from the first floor to the second floor, firing multiple shots. The video also shows the shooter walking the halls. Authorities say the shooter was armed with these guns, two assault-style rifles and a handgun, two of which were obtained legally and locally. The first about eight or ten shots were very loud. Police say when the tactical team of five officers arrived, the shooter began firing at them from a second-floor window, hitting their cruisers. There's multiple victims down inside the school. Is down now as well. 14 minutes after that first call, at 1027, these two officers, Rex Engelbert and Michael Calazzo, confronting and killing the shooter. Guns are quick. They don't give you much time. So even in a remarkably fast response, there was not enough time. In the aftermath, these images, small children holding hands, evacuating in single file lines, surrounded by law enforcement terrified faces being bused to a nearby church to safety. The three students killed, all just nine years old, Evelyn Dickhouse, William Kinney, and Haley Scruggs, the daughter of the church's pastor. Three school staff also killed, 61-year-old substitute teacher Cynthia Peake, 61-year-old custodian Mike Hill, who was said to love his job and viewed co-workers and school kids as his family, and the head of the school, 60-year-old Catherine Kuntz, described by loved ones as a remarkable woman with a bright spirit. Strong and steady and hilarious. She had this amazing sense of humor. I can't imagine a better head of a school. As police now try to piece together the motive, authorities finding writings left behind in the shooter's car in the parking lot. I literally was like, I cannot believe this. I cannot 
believe this. One of the last people to hear from the shooter, Avriana Patton, an eighth grade basketball teammate who received these Instagram messages the morning of the shooting, including, I'm planning to die today, and this is my last goodbye. Patton contacted the county sheriff's office, but didn't get a response until several hours after the shooting. Investigators searching the suspect's home, finding two more firearms described as shotguns, and a detailed map of the school with entry points, even markings showing where the security cameras were located. Authorities say the shooter had no prior criminal history. And overnight, Haley Skaggs' father releasing a statement saying, we are heartbroken. She was such a gift. And here is an incredibly sad statistic for us on this morning. The number one cause of death in children ages 1 to 19 here in the United States, gun-related violence. Robin? Absolutely heartbreaking. And it is just heartbreaking. It just makes you sick when you hear about this. So we've had two school shootings last week. Now there was a third one yesterday. So what else can be done? Later on, Katie Kirk is going to explain what, what else can be done. Also ahead, are you worried about being shy? What if we told you there's a pill that could help with shyness? You'll meet the people. You'll meet the kids out there who tested this. But coming up next, there is more about there is more about what happened in Tennessee as lawmakers discuss about gun safety and what else can be done. Stay with us. There is still more to that horrific shooting that happened in Tennessee. Now, there is new body cam footage that could shed some light. If you join us, we are talking about that horrific shooting that happened yesterday when Audrey Hill decided to shoot a total of six people, which was three children and three staff members. And I want to warn you, that video tip you're about to see is disturbing. Take a look. The shooter, a former student at the Covenant School, was shot and killed by police just 14 minutes after the attack began on Monday morning. This new body camera video shows the responding officers acting quickly. Let's go! clearly and finding the 28 year old shooter on the second floor and taking them down police have been talking with the parents of audrey hale who shot and killed three nine-year-old children and three staff members inside the covenant school while an exact motive is still under investigation law enforcement had a clearer picture of the suspect she was under care, doctor's care, for an emotional disorder. The killer's parents telling police that they believe their child should not have owned a gun. In fact, they were under the impression that one gun they knew of had already been sold. In reality, when searching the family home, police found multiple weapons, which the shooter kept hidden. We found that she had purchased uh, seven firearms from uh, five local gun stores. They were all legally purchased. Besides the three nine-year-old children, a custodian and substitute teacher were killed. The headmistress of the school, 61-year-old Catherine Kuntz, was also murdered. When asked about targeting specific victims, police said this. We have no evidence that individuals were specifically targeted. This school, this church building, was a target of the shooter. As police investigate, the community is rallying together, many dropping off teddy bears and flowers and holding prayer vigils. I'm 101 year old. <laughs> and I've done a lot of things, and, but this really hurts. And I just, I just hope they all, they're all with God. President Biden calling on Congress to do more to pass gun safety legislation. This should not be a partisan issue. It's a common sense issue. We have to act now. And police said today that even though that shooter was being treated for mental issues, no law in Tennessee would have allowed police to take away the weapons that she legally bought. Ellen McNamara, Fox 10 News. This is about common sense, so let's, so, here we go. 
Common sense alert. Okay, common sense alert. Sorry that I jumped it in there because it was I won't get it. Um the president is right, it's all about common sense. What does the law in Tennessee say about gun safety? Let's look at that law. Let's look at that from 2022. An adult and all can carry a handgun openly concealed in Tennessee without a permit. So there's Tennessee and Texas. Tennessee is a permitless carry state. Subject to some exceptions, it is unlawful to transfer a handgun to any person who is intoxicated or prohibited from gun ownership. There's no state permit. An 18 year old. I mean, there ain't no age. That that happened back in July of last, happened in July almost two almost two years ago. So, what does common sense tell you? There needs to be safety and education, and that brings us to Let's see if I can find it. But um, I remember that there there was a Let's see if I can find it. But it sounds like what we need to do is change the law that would prohibit. Anybody from buying guns. I mean, think about what happened in Uvalde. This is actually the same thing that happened in Uvalde. So let's look at what happened after. Because really, it's all about the it's all about the safety of all students here. When you're looking at safety. Let me move you around a bit. Move you here. There we go. That's what you worry about. You worry about safety. So take a look at this clip. Ben, thank you. WFM News News Amber Lake heard from Triad School Districts on another angle of this story today. Amber, the conversation twofold. They talked about security. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Ben, thank you. WFM News News Amber Lake heard from Triad School Districts on another angle of this story today. Amber, the conversation twofold. They talked about security measures already in place and new safety features on the horizon. Yeah, this is a detailed document going over the security measures at Winston-Salem for Scythe County Schools. It was given to us earlier today. It talks about what the district has in place to keep students, staff, and visitors safe. Safety features include surveillance cameras on every single campus, occasional body scanners, safety vestibules. The superintendent and chief safety security officer for the school system told me safety comes first in schools, then comes education. At every school in Forsyth County, visitors need to be buzzed into the main office. All middle and high schools have portable medical detectors. This is the continued effort of making sure what happened yesterday in Nashville doesn't happen here. And we've replaced 
and improve our camera systems in every single school in this school district. The, the schools that are currently under construction will get those same type camera systems. Door access control started in middle schools and now it's expanded through our high schools and we're going to vote tonight, the school board's going to vote tonight to expand that to elementary schools so that we are completely 100% have access control in our school district. Um, and so we've actually increased SRO presence in the last two years. The contract we have with the Sheriff's Office and with uh, Kernersville Police Department actually continues to grow each year because we continue to, to um, assess our needs and make changes. It costs $5 million a year to have those SROs. In order for elementary schools to have them, more money is needed. We also reached out to the Alamance Burlington School System about its continued safety efforts. They told me they have SROs on every campus and have added safety vestibules, additional cameras, as well as other safety improvements. Now, when it comes to safety in Guilford County schools, district leaders say they need more money to continue using the touchless body scanners that are in all high schools. So far, investigators say scanners detected and stopped two guns from getting into schools. Which was good. That was good. So we'll keep following this story, and on a future show, we'll teach you about what happens. Still to come. Is there a problem about, is there, still to come, is there an issue about shyness? What if we told you there was a pill that could really help understand shyness, it could help prevent shyness or control shyness? But up next, Katie Kirk is going to explain how, how to prevent these school shootings happening again with some common sense. Stay with us. Oxford is back in the news now. With the text messages that are that are obtained from the Court of Appeals, in its decision to uphold a ruling that sends the parents to Oxford High School shoot on trial for inter inter involuntary manslaughter charges, the Michigan Court of Appeals laid out specific details that give more insight to events that that preceded the shooting. So let's take a look at these text messages starting from March twenty first. This was from March 2021, which was, was seven months before the shooting. There's someone in the house, I think. Someone walked in the bathroom and flushed the toilet and, set the, and left the light on. And I thought it was you, but when I came out, there was no one home. There is no one in the house, though. Dude, my, my door just slammed. Jennifer Crumlin did not respond to these messages. About 10 minutes later, the shooter repeatedly sent two follow-up messages saying, hey, it's my paranoia. But we ain't going to be home. About a week later, the shooter was home alone again and sent more texts to his mother concerned that they were, there was a demon in his house. Okay, the house is now haunted. Some weird shit just happened. And now I'm scared. I got some videos. And a picture of the demon. It is throwing balls. I'm not joking. It blanked up the kitchen. I'm going to be an outsider for a while. Can you at least text back? Jennifer did not respond to any text messages that day. The court said, however, pictures on the phone reportedly showed that there was photographing her himself. James Crumlin was riding horses at the same time her son sending the text. Two days later, after the text about the demon, Jennifer Crumlin messaged her husband to see how their son was doing. He woke up something looking like he had way too much drink that night complaining about a headache. That was from James. Jennifer, well, he was really, well, he was really worked up and out of control. I can see why. All I know is he needs to eat, go to work, and work hard, and not complain and get his stuff back. He, he can get his stuff back. He said, let me ask you a question. Why am I in your guys' room? LOL. OMG. I totally thought you were giving him the X Men, even X Max last X Max last night. The mom responded saying he gave her some melatonin. The court said. Now, this was on March. The shooter was apparently home alone and sent another text, one after another. I cleaned until the clothes started flying off the shelf. This this stuff only happens when I'm home alone. I picked up the clothes. I picked the clothes back up though. 
In the court document, it said Jennifer Connelly did not respond to these messages. She was reportedly at the horse barn with those messages sent. Now we go into April. April of last, we go to April 2021, which is almost a, which is almost two years ago. The court then laid out a text on April 5th, 2021, in which the shooter texted his friend about his mental health. Going to ask my parents to go to the doctor tomorrow or Tuesday again. This time, I'm going to tell them all about the voices. I only told them about the people I see. Those follow-up messages, the shooter told his friend that he requested medical help. But his father refused and instead gave him pills to tell him, suck it up. The shooter said his mother laughed at the request and said he was using drugs and didn't have mental health issues. The shooter then told his friend to consider calling 911 to someone who would get him help. But he ultimately decided not to because he thought his parents would be mad at him if he did, the court said. March 4, we go forward to August now, which was... Two months, three months before the shooting. Three months before the shooting, the shooter was messaging his friend about guns. Communications between the shooter and his friend were about more than just mental health issues and problems with defendants. The court ruling reads, while many of the messages contain normal teenage banter, others in following conversations warning about wanting guns and making them plans to buy them. The shooter sends one 11 second video from loading a magazine to a Point twenty two Caltech handgun registered to his father. The friend said, Nice. Now pull the trigger. JK, 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 JK. My dad is my dad my dad left it out, so I thought why not? LOL. Shooter, I know gun safety, so it's no problem. Now it's time to shoot up the gun. JK, 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 JK. October. The court says the text message between the shooter and his brother and friends showed the shooter still believed he was having a mental breakdown and there was no signs of him getting no signs he was gonna get help. Near the end of October, the shooter's conversation with his friend via text message stopped, the court documents said. Now we go to November 29th, which was the day before. The murder then initiated a text conversation with the shooter the same morning. Jennifer said, Seriously, looking up bullets in school? The shooter says, What? Oh yeah, I already went to the office for that. It was the first hour. All I did was look at a certain caliber at the end of the class because I was curious. It was on my phone, completely harmless. The teachers have, just have no privacy. They said I am all good. I understand why. I sick. They talked to me and they said I could. That I am good, sick. This is nothing. I should get. This is nothing you should get in trouble about. Jennifer responded saying herself was not in trouble. Just as she wanted him to know, she got a voicemail about the situation. Did you at least show him the pic of your new gun? No, I didn't show him my new pic. My God. I only told him I went to the range with you on Saturday. It was a harmless set. I have this bullet cartridge in my room that I didn't know what kind of bullet it was. And when it's sitting about point twenty two at the end of the first hour. I just looked up different types of point twenty two bullets. And I guess the teachers can't get their eyes on my own from the screen. SMH. LOL, I'm not mad. You have to learn not to get caught. I know. LOL, with laughing emojis. Now I go into the November 30th. The events occurred on that mo morning. 1231. Jennifer Crumley texted her one son asking if he was okay. Around the same time, the shooter responded saying he was okay and just had to finish, and just had to finish lunch. Same time. You know you can talk to us and we won't judge. I know. Thank you. I'm sorry for that. I love you. 118. Jennifer Crumley texted her son, I love you too. And you okay? He texted him saying, don't do it. The gun is gone. And so are the bullets. Apparently referring to the purchasing new weapon that, that was missing from home. 134, Jim James was going to call 911 and explain that he believed his son is, was the object for shooting at the gun and the issues from his home. So, who was to blame? Probably it was, again, parents both to blame. But if they're convicted, they could face prison time. But now the bond is being lowered, and we could learn more about this. But I don't want to spend another hour talking, I don't want to spend another 10 minutes talking about.
talking about what's going on here because really it's just it's just what the heck is going on here. All right. You've heard about the three school shootings that happened. Two last week and one yesterday. Up next, there are three ways to prevent school shootings, according to a researcher, that could help counsel children out of this. Stay with us. Are there other ways that we can prevent these school shootings from happening? Well, there is. According to some researchers, there are three ways you can do this. Just six hours ago, Katie Kerr released a released a podcast explaining this. So let's take a look. We can certainly try to change the gun laws. We can try to do all those things to make sure that someone who shouldn't have access to a firearm doesn't have access. But the truth is right now, if someone really wants to get access, they can't get access. So given that situation, there are three actions we can take based on research to prevent school violence and school shootings. The first is to make sure that students and staff and parents receive training on the warning signs for violence so that they can report those warning signs. The second is to make sure that everywhere in our country we have anonymous reporting systems that are available 24 7. so anyone can report a concern that they see anonymously they don't have to worry about their safety in that report and then the third area is something that's called behavioral threat assessment and threat management and that is where we have a team of people that understand is this a real threat or is this something that really poses a threat and then they track and make sure that that person is managed and is getting the supports that they need. It's a really great question of how do we discern, you know, what behaviors are concerning. And the Secret Service put, has put out a list of 10 concerning behaviors based on looking at previous school shootings and what were the common characteristics. And, you know, there's things on that list like over fascination with weapons, intense and escalating anger, fascination with Columbine shooters or other mass shooters. There's also things on that list like depression, failing grades or concerns over schools, like things that are really common across lots of adolescents so you know how do you how is it a, a citizen a parent do you know what to do so what we say is if you are observing concerns make the report either find a trusted adult or so if they're telling you you become that trusted adult or make an anonymous report don't try to figure it out yourself whether or not this rises to that level that's a really hard thing to do. So we always say, err on the side of caution. Make the, re the report from the idea of like, I'm trying to get this person help. Now, if there is a pattern going on, let's say in, in Colorado, we have this safe to tell, which is an anonymous reporting system. They're gonna get multiple tips and those tips are gonna go to a, a team at the school, a law enforcement team. The right people will get the information to do that appropriate investigation. All over the country, schools are doing safety drills where they're doing, you know, a lockdown and they're teaching kids what to do if there is a shooting in their school. And we call that crisis response. And it is important that those are practiced and they're done in ways that don't create trauma. But in addition to those drills, there's a lot more that we can be doing. And what we really recommend is making sure that, that even young children understand what are those warning signs for violence and how to report those those warning signs. We recommend just let a trusted adult know. We teach them what does that mean? What is a trusted adult? And then in many places around the country, there are these anonymous reporting systems. And we want every kid to know what their system is 
They're not everywhere. So there is still a need to make sure that everybody has access to an, an anonymous way to report. But the thing with these anonymous systems is that the school culture needs to say, we want you to report any any concerns. We want all of us to do that. That's our culture. It's not tattletaling. It's about our, the safety of all of us. So we really recommend making sure that you're, you know, all the schools are putting in a program like that. That can also be reinforced at home. It can be reinforced in the community level as well. When we, we look at these after attack reports, and we've looked at so many, and we see the same thing over and over again. For the Arapaho High School shooting that happened in 2013, we saw that there were 27 missed opportunities to intervene on behalf of the shooter. In the Parklands shooting, they found at least 69 missed opportunities to intervene. There is such a huge role that the community at large can play in addressing the warning signs for violence, addressing concerns that people see around bullying. A term that we talk about in research is a term called collective efficacy. And that term is about being willing to get involved, to take action on behalf of your community and really seeing that it's all of our collective responsibility to create safety. It's not something that we just want to turn to our teachers or turn to law enforcement. It's about getting help for people that need help. It's about opportunities to teach young people a better way. And in communities that have higher rates of collective efficacy, they have lower levels of violence. So the more people stand up and take this action, the better off we're all going to be. I mean, when it gets to the point of mass violence, it harms everybody in such a huge way. So the more we all can work upstream so that doesn't happen, the better off our society's gonna be. And that's the ways you can prevent these school shootings happening. So remember, if you see something, you say something. That ain't tattling. Just like bullying. Telling someone is that tattling. You could be a hero. How would you like a pill to help you out with shyness? Coming up next, you're going to meet somebody that created that pill. It's a familiar pill you use to help with depression. Prozac. Sarah James on Prozac shyness. Stay with us. When you were a baby, were you ever shy or being left out? In this next story, you're going to see some studies that have been done. And you'll also see a pill that would help out shyness. It's a familiar pure pill being used by people in this case. So can a pill really help this? You're about to meet some people who... You're about to see some people and see some studies that could help shed some light on shyness. Here's Sarah James. By most accounts, Sarah Glenn is an accomplished young woman, a gifted musician, a Harvard University graduate, with a good job at a leading biotechnology company. You'd think someone like Sarah would have all the confidence in the world. But Sarah spends most of her time doubting herself. Sarah says it's because she's shy. How long would you say that you've been shy? Um, all my life, I would say. Sarah, now 28, can remember being shy as far back as nursery school. I remember I would sit in a corner and like suck my fingers <laughs> and just kind of and not, you know, not really um, interact with the other kids. I guess other people just seemed, it just seemed kind of scary or something. According to many prominent experts, shyness is considered universal. Most of us say we're shy at some time or another, and a recent survey of college students showed that half think of themselves as shy. But for others, shyness is so painful, it's disabling, affecting every aspect of daily life. And as you're about to discover tonight, Dramatic new research provides startling clues about just why some people are so extremely shy. 
and offers hope for possible new treatments. When did you begin to feel that your shyness was a problem? Teenager years. That's when it became excruciating. I felt isolated from the other kids. And like, I was just very nervous speaking in front of the class and stuff like that. And today, what seem like the most ordinary acts of everyday life still leave Sarah under considerable stress. Things like talking to a coworker she doesn't know very well. And situations that make most of us nervous, like giving a presentation at work or talking to her boss, are simply overwhelming. <laughs> Often, she even feels uncomfortable around close friends and her family. And just imagine how she might feel if she had to face a room full of strangers at a cocktail party. Well, it might be something like this. I would get the physiological response pretty much everybody gets when they're very frightened and heart pounding and just, you know, feeling shaky and your hands are cold. What sort of thoughts would come to your mind? Very extreme things like I'll fail or people will think I'm an idiot or I'm not, you know, I'm not good enough or I'm not worthy. I don't belong in this situation. Over time, Sarah's shyness has led to isolation. Rather than learning to deal with her uncomfortable feelings, she started to avoid most social situations. It was so extreme that it was like, what would you do if you saw a tiger running towards you? I mean, you know, you'd run. And it felt like a tiger running towards you. That strong. That's a lot of emotion, Sarah. Mm -hmm. But there was no escape from her fear or her pain. Do you think people realize how intense shyness can be if they're not shy? No. What do you think they don't understand? Am I upsetting you? What are you thinking? I just don't think people who are not shy can understand how painful it is. But that may be changing because the very nature of how experts think about shyness is changing. Here at Harvard University, researchers have been studying a group of children since they were four months old, old enough to show signs of distress, but too young to be influenced by their environment. The goal? To test a hypothesis that some people may be born with a biological makeup to become shy. Dr. Jerome Kagan is a distinguished professor of psychology at Harvard who has won many prestigious awards for his work on shyness. Currently, he's conducting the ongoing shyness study. When we looked at the four-month-old infants and saw that certain qualities could predict who would be timid, shy when they were three, four years old, that was a very big surprise. Meet six-year-old Blair Bailey and seven-year-old Lisa Locke. Both girls live in the suburbs of Boston and are two of the more than 500 children who took part in Dr. Kagan's study. The researchers wanted to see if they could predict which babies would grow into shy children and which would become bold. So they followed the children for five years and eliminated any whose parents divorced or experienced any other kind of trauma that could be an environmental cause of shyness. Over the years, the researchers tested the children's responses to a series of unfamiliar events, starting with loud recorded voices placed away from the children. Hello, pretty baby. How are you today? This is Blair Bailey when she was four months old. You have been a very good baby today. She remains rather relaxed. Notice she's not crying. She's not showing any fear on her face. She's not becoming highly aroused to this unfamiliar stimulation. And look what happens when a mobile that Blair has never seen before is swung in front of her. Again, no crying, no fretting, no fussing. She stays relatively relaxed. How do you know, though, that she's not a little bored or that maybe she's not as bright? We tested her brightness later. If she were bored, then she would look away. Hello, pretty baby. How are you today? And this is Lisa Locke at four months. You have been a very good baby today. Notice she's hearing the same sentences, and she, unlike Blair, you see she cries. She was bothered by it, by the strangeness, by the unfamiliarity. Now she's looking to see where her mother is. Are you ready for some nice... See, she's moving her legs much more than Blair did. Notice the tension in her fingers. Notice the movement of the back. 
Now look what happens when Lisa is shown the same mobile. Look at that. She got so aroused that she almost fell out of the chair. We call these infants high reactive. That makes sense because they're very reactive to very innocent stimulation. And they are the ones who are more likely to be the inhibited, subdued children. How do you know, though, doctor, that she just didn't have a bad night? She didn't sleep very well. Maybe she's got an upset stomach. Because we have 100 other Lisas who do the same thing. And so it happens 100 times. It's unlikely that every one of the children who we said was highly arousable at 16 weeks also had a bad night. And remember Blair Bailey, who seemed so relaxed as an infant? Well, watch what happens at age 21 months when Blair and her mother enter a room they've never been in before. It's filled with unfamiliar things. Blair comes in, leaves her mother at once, starts to climb around, is not worried about hurting herself, stands up on the cabinet, notice she talks, jumps up and down. Blair isn't afraid of anything in this room, including a scary mask. She explores it with no fear, doesn't look at her mother, to see whether this is okay to do. At 21 months, is this surprising, this level of independence, willingness to go into an unfamiliar setting? Not for this temperamental type of child. The vast majority of the children who behaved as Blair did at four months, two-thirds behave in this very freestyle, talking a lot, not staying close to their mother. And now watch Lisa Locke, who was agitated by the tests as an infant, react to the same unfamiliar setting at age 21 months. Lisa is uncomfortable. She wants to leave. Look at this. She is pulling her mother up. She She's is, insistent. She has become anxious, fearful. She wants to get out of here because this is not a place that's familiar to her while Blair was unbothered. Watch what happens at age four and a half when the children were asked to complete a series of tasks by a researcher they just met in a room they'd never seen before. Uh, what is this for? To hear what's going on inside your body. From the moment she entered the room, Blair, who was so unafraid and relaxed when tested as a baby, had a lot to say and obviously was comfortable, even when asked to do something that normally a child might be punished for. Scribble in the brand new book. She made over 200 comments in this particular hour, which is very high. The average is 50. Why? Wow. Me neither. What do you think we should do? We should do This girl of over 200 children smiled the most in this hour. What do you want to do, or should we do the next one? Next one. She smiled almost 100 times. Pour the juice on the table. What's that for? See, she questions why she should do this. That's what these bold children do. They don't do everything they're told. See, she knows it's wrong, so she's stalling. Why? I don't know. Me neither. Silly, what do you think we should do? <laughs> Jump it. Okay. You going to? I don't know. She's not afraid to say to this adult, well, wait a minute. I'm not sure I should do that. As the testing continues, Blair starts to have fun tear up my favorite picture. She realized this is a game and, and okay, I'll go along with the game. <laughs> now here's Lisa at age four and a half, who again was agitated by the tests as a baby. Scribble in a brand new book. She thought about whether I should do this and then she does make some marks. It's going to be harder for her to say, no, I don't want to do that. Remember, the price of saying no is maybe the examiner will criticize me. But you see, she's concerned about it. She rubbed her forehead. Mm -hmm. but she, knows she, she, here. she noticed she's not smiling. The way Look at her did. hands. Yes, she, well, she's a little tense about this. Lisa completed each task quickly and anxiously. She didn't speak at all during the testing and for the most part glanced down rather than making eye contact with the researcher. All signs of shy behavior. Remember how Blair smiled and laughed and as a joke, this is all quite serious for Lisa. Remember, the predictions Dr. Kagan made about which babies were more likely to become shy and which might become bold were made when the infants were just four months old, long before the effects of parenting would be felt. Dr. Kagan's theory that some people may be born with a biological predisposition to become shy remains unproven, but he says his hunch is based on well-documented research. 
He says his preliminary findings, that two-thirds of the agitated babies became shy and two-thirds of the relaxed babies became bold, support his idea. I've always felt a sense that somehow I react to things more strongly than other people. Do you think that you were, in essence, born shy? Yes, definitely. Although not everyone who is shy was born with this predisposition, and no one is discounting the important role that the environment and parenting play, Dr. Kagan's research is helping Sarah Glenn, and millions of people like her, recognize that biology may be a contributing factor to shyness. It takes a little bit of the brunt off me. I mean, I don't have to say it's all my fault. But is it her fate? Could the answer to her lifelong shyness problem be as simple as taking a pill? All right, so could this new pill, could this pill really help with shyness, whoever's shy or not? The answer may surprise you when we return. You'll also see that pill as a familiar form as Sarah Jane continues looking into the shyness of Prozac. Stay with us. Well, we're out of time, but we're going to continue this tomorrow. Now, could this new pill help with shyness? And what about the other kids we've seen? Will they take the pill too? Is it a medical breakthrough that could help with shyness? Don't miss tomorrow. Here's a sneak preview. Occasionally, we'll see really dramatic responses where extremely shy, inhibited kids within a matter of a month or so are speaking very freely and really not looking like particularly shy children at all. Don't miss the conclusion to shyness. Coming up on Friday, a doctor, a sociologist who says a lot of people spank. You're going to see three parents who participate in 2020, who let 2020 cameras follow them for several days as they spank. Who spanked and who didn't spank. You also see what happens when, when doctors try to phase in some new ideas when it came to discipline. When it comes to discipline of kids. That's on Friday. Also coming up tomorrow on the broadcast, we'll, also, we'll update you on, on that horrific shooting. That's also tomorrow. Then also tomorrow, Why fast foods are struggling to hire employees, even though, even though the people say it may be hiring. Plus, plus an update about those wrong, plus those wrong way drivers. Plus those wrong way drivers, the camera hits installed. Also, there was a lockdown that happened. That happened on, that happened. So all that's coming up, coming up tomorrow, along with that shyness. So could this new people really help with shyness? And we also can tell you some ways that you can prevent shyness from happening so you can be more communicative. The best way that I recommend it is by using dolls, using like baby dolls. That way you can help, help speak and communicate. And coming up soon in the broadcast, we're going to talk about an issue that really just stands out to me. Really just seems like I don't know, I got no words for. It. We're talking about teen pregnancy. Cause it's a growing number of trends. It's another it's reasons why kids skip class. If your daughter if your daughter wants to become pregnant or 
if your daughter is pregnant at 16 or at a teen at teen years, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a show for you. It's something you don't want to miss. So that's coming up coming up soon in the broadcast. And that's giving me a break for this Monday. I mean Tuesday. Sorry about that. That's giving me a break for this Tuesday. We'll see you again tomorrow for giving me a break Wednesday. For everyone here at YouTube. Good night, everyone.